Aretha Franklin, Beyonce, D'Angelo, John Legend, Anderson Pack, what do they all have in common? Like countless other black musicians, they've all gained their foundation and love for music through the black church and the music it birthed, gospel. It's Sunday and I'm going to church. I'm in Orlando, Florida at Live Church where Grammy winning artist and gospel music star Ty Tribbett leads the congregation. Mainstream, secular, gospel, everybody seems to come through the church to like hone their gifts, you know, because that's the place where a lot of people are accepted. You can make mistakes and not because you're not on TV reading charts. You're just like trying to figure it out. Musicians that I know yeah. literally came through GA and Soundcheck, yeah. actually, that, that we see now. Music in the church is uh, unconventional, and like I said, it's not charted. You can kind of like try things and be like <laughs> weird, but it's, it it's works. okay, let's try like it. Put, it, put the bass there. there. Okay. <laughs> in the church, you can make those mistakes mm -hmm. that are turn out to be genius in another field. Yeah! L.A. and I are in Chicago, where the work of gospel pioneers like Thomas Dorsey and Mahalia Jackson gave rise to what we know as gospel music. But the city doesn't only hold gospel music's past. Chicago gospel musicians are constantly pushing this great art form and their skills forward. It definitely is Chicago is the home for gospel, hands down. Okay, so we're in the right spot. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about the, the church, the black church being a training ground for musicians. It's a training ground, but also too, everyone is so on top of their skill and not really know the raw skill is so great mm -hmm. that it's like singing at the Apollo. You have to be good. <laughs> like you don't have a choice or else you just don't get up there, you know? So that's why some of the great singers like an Aretha or like Whitney or like so many came out of church because we hear it all the time. And it's others that you haven't heard that probably equally as good that you will never hear. Yeah. I think the musicians of this time are so skilled, like they're incredibly skilled. Their ears are not the same, but mm. their ability really? is like out of here. Word. It really is out of here. Mm. Really is out. I always tell y'all make it too complicated. <laughs> yeah, I think you're over. I always say you're overthinking. Yeah. It's not that. It's not that complicated. It's really just, <laughs> you know, two, three, six, five, five, then back to one. But you're trying to make trying it like a thirteenth, and then you're trying to expand it too much. I was like, it's not that complicated. <laughs> Right there, let me show you what they would do in, 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 in church now. The melody is, all mm. that is within me. Instead of going to the, yeah, instead of going to that yeah. six, right. Dun, 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 dun. Exactly. Uh, now you go to the next chord, the, the chord is just right. That's it. That's the sweet. That's is, is. So who created black gospel music? Many historians will tell you it was Thomas A. Dorsey. He's now regarded as the father of black gospel music but Dorsey's career didn't start out in the church. Born in Georgia, Dorsey began as a blues musician and went by the name Georgia Tom. He toured alongside blues legend Ma Rainey and wrote hundreds of blues and jazz songs. Some were a little risque, like the hit he wrote with guitarist Tampa Red. It's Tight Like That from 1928. In the 1920s, Dorsey had an epiphany. He began to turn away from secular music and started writing gospel songs. But he didn't leave his past behind. He often infused his gospel music with the feel and structure of the blues. His gospel song, If You See My Savior, is swung and upbeat. It follows a 16-bar blues chord progression and has a steady 4-4 time signature that you can easily stomp your feet to. His lyrics, however, are more hopeful and uplifting than most blues songs. Dorsey is offering a touching send-off to someone who's about to depart to the other side. Tell them I am coming home. Someday. In 1932, Dorsey came here to Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, where he served as music director for more than 40 years. 
In 2006, this historic church building was gutted by fire and the whole congregation moved across the street. That's uh, the, one of the things that made Professor Dorsey famous. Is that he combined uh, the blues and church music and gave it uh, that rhythm and swing that uh, a lot of people weren't ready for. Dorsey also employs call and response in many of his songs, an element in African music where one phrase is the call and a different phrase is the answer. Like in his song, Never Turn Back. Call and response is historical from slavery times because blacks could not read at that time and there was always one person around who could and they would read it and everyone else would repeat it behind them. In the morning when I rise or mm -hmm. I'm gonna lay down my burdens. Down by the riverside. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Call and response is integral to gospel music and can be found in secular music as well, from artists like James Brown to Kendrick Lamar. Sit down. Frank, Frank. Stand up. Frank, Frank. Pass out. Frank, Frank. Also in 1932, Dorsey lost his wife and son during childbirth. This tragedy led him to write what is considered one of the greatest gospel songs ever written, Take My Hand, Precious Lord. Precious Lord. Unlike If You Meet My Savior, Precious Lord maintains the emotion of the blues without adhering to its structure. Check out Dorsey himself performing the song in the 1998 documentary, The Story of Gospel Music. When I look back. Just to see him, we stood in awe of him. You know, that was history. However, Dorsey was not always celebrated. Professor Dorsey came actually from Ebenezer Baptist Church, where he started. But they did not uh, allow him to do his music the way he wanted to do it. So he left there and came to Pilgrim. He faced opposition for blending blues and gospel with some ministers calling it the devil's music. A lot of uh, the old time church folks were saying that he was playing the devil's music, that it wasn't of God. Well, I mean, uh, you can liken it until today mm -hmm. uh, when we're doing hip hop mm -hmm. in the church. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, uh, old people say, oh, oh, that's the old devil. No, mm -hmm. it's just a new style um, that's come to us to give the Lord praise. No, let's stand for prayer. <laughs> God, God, we thank you. Okay, we're ready to finish. Amen. As far as the blending of genres, some people feel like it waters down the gospel message. Message is words and sound is sound. So I don't understand how you can take a message down with sound. Hmm. I think more so religion does that versus spirituality or even God, because when God made music, he didn't say this bass part is secular and this bass part is gospel. We did that. Blending gospel and secular sounds hasn't stopped. Pioneers like Andre Crouch and Kirk Franklin have been mixing gospel with everything from funk to rock to hip hop. It's this cross pollination of genres that makes gospel music so adaptable to the times and why gospel musicians are so versatile. We play it all. speak on how your church has embraced this new wave of music, the, uh, the shared exchange between gospel music and secular music. It's, a, it's, it's an exchange of influence. Mm -hmm. It's like how my music is outside of the church. I think it's a little bit for everybody. I think um, the biggest problem I had even at Sony Records was what category do we put this guy in? Is this, is, is, is this hip hop gospel? Is this da -da 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 -da? So we just coined this phrase, kingdom music. We didn't want to alienate anybody and we didn't want to, be, we didn't want to become elitist either. It's very, very broad. You can get old school tambourine, chicken eating film. Church. Yeah, when you get, get a song worship film, <laughs> when you just honor the Lord. You know what I'm saying? There's, 
or we could get straight street. We embrace all forms of music mm -hmm. so we can reach all forms of people with one message. Indeed. I came from the, the shed jam session thing. I just had like sheds, just jam sessions at the house all the time. And from those, some from those pieces of, of, of grooves that we locked into, I wrote songs. Like No Way came from a shed groove. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, man, come on. <laughs> the term woodshedding gained popularity among jazz musicians in the 1930s. It means to go someplace, like behind the woodshed, to practice your skills where no one else can hear. But in the early 2000s, shedding became something new thanks to Gerald Forrest, the creator of a website called Gospel Chops. Originally, the website was going to focus on church organists and pianists, but Forrest shifted its focus to drummers after he uploaded a video of Eric Moore breaking down what was arguably the first ever documented gospel chop. In the mid-2000s, gospel chops became a phenomenon. Tony and Thomas's shed is arguably one of the most memorable sheds of all time. Here, one can see those integral parts of gospel music. Tony and Thomas are responding to each other's rhythmic calls and doing so on the spot. So a question for both of you, basically. I've never been to a shed session. I'm not really sure. I've since learned about it, but I, I, I don't know what, what to expect. What can I do? Oh, it'll be a vibe, though. It'll be, it'll a, vibe. be a vibe. So it's like, I'll have the click tracks running on the NPC app. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. And we're going to blast it through the monitors. Wow. So everybody can hear and keep that's up cool. with it. Yeah, and, and that's cool. And that's happening at 7 today? 8. We'll get there at 8, but... Um, How many people are coming? I'm hoping. Try to make it a party. Oh. For gospel drummers like myself, nothing sharpens skills more than shedding. <laughs> This is how shedding works. There are two simple rules. One, you establish the groove, and two, you trade solos while keeping the one, or the downbeat. Locking in the groove is an important step in shedding because it gives context to all of the chops, licks, and fills. The groove is the template that we all work within, and it allows the trading of solos to make sense. Depending on the tempo of the groove, drummers will solo for either four or eight bars. Four bars for slower tempos, eight bars for faster tempos. What started as musicians jamming after church services turned into a safe haven for young black musicians. This adaptability continues to push gospel music into new musical territory. And in churches all across the country, the next generation of musicians are shedding their skills. Just look at Justin Wilson II, better known as the drumming prodigy, baby boy drummer on Instagram. Here, he plays alongside notable gospel musicians Robert Bubby Lewis and Justin Raines at the 2019 NAMM convention. The young drummer holds his own alongside the other musicians in what is essentially a shed session. The exchange is a testament to the Black Gospel Church as a training ground for artists and musicians. What gospel music is and sounds like continues to change, but there's no denying that the Black Gospel Church provides a foundation for future musicians who will one day share their gifts with the world. But the gospel music industry, I, I just, I mean, it's so open, it could be anything now. I, I like that it's not just choir robes now. It's so vast because everybody's not just exposed to their lane, everybody's exposed to everything. So there must be a, a culture of working extremely hard to get to that level surrounding this community, right? I don't even know if it's work to get there. I think that because that's all you hear, it just shows up. It's the, yeah, you around those church services every just, day of the week. Yeah, like if you hear somebody speaking another language all of your life, then you speak. It's 
it's just a part of the community, so you just do it, you know? You just learn how to dance because everybody's dancing. It's the norm. It's the norm. It's very much a norm. One more time,